can't go wrong with a pastor named Rocky, I'll tell you. It's good to be here with you tonight. I wish that I weren't. I say that almost everywhere I go, but uh, I'm not here just to share with you memories of my daughter. I'm also here to talk to you about a whole spiritual side of what happened in Columbine. It was a result of something that's brewed in this nation for a long time, that it's time that somebody addressed. It's, it's time that the majority of these people had their voice heard in this country. And I'm going to get to several things tonight before I'm finished, but I just want to begin by, ask, by thanking you for all of your tears that were shed for us, all of your prayers that were prayed. I'm by no means the only parent that's ever lost a child, and there's people here in this room that have lost children, and you didn't have the whole world grieving with you. You didn't have the whole world praying for you like we did. As tragic as the loss was, we were blessed to have the support of people from around the world. And many of you saw my daughter's funeral on CNN. Many of you have prayed for us by name. And many of you have prayed for us generically, just praying for the victims' families that were killed at Columbine. But my heart goes out to parents who lose children. And uh, I meet them everywhere I go. We belong to a club we wish we did not have a membership in. And there's a common bond that I find with people who've lost children. And again, I just want to say my heart goes out to you if you've lost a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter. Well, normally I bring a videotape with me. And last night, around midnight, I put the wrong tape in my baggage. And so I'm without my videotape tonight. So I'm going to just share with you from my heart uh, some of the things that normally is seen on video. On April the 20th, 1999, I got up and I went to a mall across town. I had a little booth in an antique mall. I did that sort of as a secondary hobby. And I was a sales manager for a food company. And about 11.30, 11.45, I got a phone call from my wife saying that there had been a shooting at Columbine. And the way she said it was a shooting at Columbine. And I thought that maybe a, a young person had taken a gun and shot it in the air or shot it at someone. I didn't know that anyone had been hit, that there was uh, any deaths or injuries. But I ran out to my truck and headed for the school and as I turned on my radio, suddenly reports began to come in, and I was absolutely petrified by what I was hearing on the radio, that there were literally dozens of kids that were being shot and a number that were being killed. And as I got close to the school, there was a massive traffic jam, and it took me almost an hour and a half to go about five miles, the last five miles to the school itself. I was tempted at times just to get out of my truck and run, but the traffic was in both sides going the same direction friends, relatives, loved ones, and we were hearing worse and worse reports on the radio, and, and my heart was pounding, and I was crying. I knew I had two children at that school, my son Craig and my daughter Rachel, and also knew that my brother had two uh, kids at that school, Sarah Scott and Jeff Scott, my niece and nephew, and so I was thinking of the four of them specifically, not counting their friends and other people that we knew that had children there, and as I was praying, the Lord just let a peace come into my heart, despite my terror, despite my tears despite my anguish and despite my heart pounding I felt a peace settle in my soul and I didn't understand that but the Lord began to speak something to my heart and looking back on that time and time again I've looked back and, and been reassured that God's hand was there with Rachel that day as it was with Craig my son because the words I kept hearing was this is a spiritual event this is a spiritual event this is a spiritual event now that may sound strange to some of you who've only seen the tragedy itself and a lot of you have seen Many, many clips from Columbine and kids running from the school and those that had been wounded and pictures of children laying on the grass outside. One of those was my daughter. She was outside the school. She was one of two that was killed outside the school. My son Craig was in the library and he saw eight of his friends killed before his very eyes. Cassie Bernal was killed 10 feet behind him. His two best friends, or two of his best friends, I should say, were killed beside him. He looked down the barrel of a gun and he thought he was going to die. He literally thought he had breathed his last breath. And I talk to my son every day that I'm not able to be with him on the phone. I talked to him just a couple of hours ago. And the trauma that he went through victimized him for the rest of his life. Thank God for your prayers and thank God that he does bring healing to wounds. And Craig is doing extremely well. People ask about him everywhere. He's the young man that you saw interviewed by Katie Couric shortly after the tragedy. And he was uh, featured in Dateline not too long ago in a report. But Craig is doing awesome. He has really completely given his life to the Lord and he wants to follow in his sister's footsteps and make an impact on his generation. When I got to the elementary school, 
One of the worst memories of my life was watching a, a group of people a little larger than this group. We were crammed into an elementary gymnasium, and they began to bring uh, students from Columbine in buses, and they marched them across the stage, and they called out their name as they, each one would walk across the stage. And one of the most horrible memories of my life was watching that crowd of people dwindle down slowly until there was just a handful left, and we were told that there was one bus load of young people coming from Columbine, and that would be it. And I rushed outside most of the parents rushed outside we couldn't wait and as the bus pulled up to stand on tiptoe and and look in that bus and, and try to see rachel we already knew that craig had gotten out alive and uh i can't even begin to describe to you the feelings as i turned around and looked in the faces of families that would never see their child alive again one family would never see their dad and husband alive again and it was 24 hours before we knew for sure and you always hold on to hope we prayed and hoped that she was in a locker somewhere hiding or under stairs or somewhere in a closet so we had a sleepless night that night but those words rang over and over in my heart that god had spoken to me on my way to that elementary school this is a spiritual event this is a spiritual event i shared that immediately after the tragedy and people looked at me like i was crazy so i quit sharing it for a while but i actually shared it on a couple of national interviews and i know people thought i was nuts but i'll tell you something after looking back a year and a half later I've spoken in the last year and a half to over one million people face to face, not counting the television programs, the radio programs, the books, the magazines, the newspapers. And I've seen personally, firsthand, literally over 100,000 young people come to know the Lord Jesus for the first time in their life. And I'm able to stand here tonight and tell you that those words that God spoke to my heart a year and a half ago have proven over and over to be true, that Columbine was a spiritual event. It was a revolutionary awakening in this country, not only for teenagers, but I saw the media, I saw the people that you see every day on television firsthand as they were deeply touched and they began to examine a side of their life that they had never taken a look at before. I've been able to lead a number of cameramen and a number of newspaper people. I wish I could say national television people, but I haven't. But I've been able to lead a number of them to the Lord through this tragedy. And my, my daughter prayed a prayer in her diaries that I'm going to read to you in just a few minute, minutes. But she prayed this prayer over and over in her writing. She said, God... I want you to use me to reach the unreached. And I want you to know God has answered her prayer a multitude of times. Rachel kept a series of diaries, and one of the diaries I carry with me all the time, this was in her backpack the day she was killed. And on the front of this diary, she had written the words, I write not for the sake of glory, not for the sake of fame, not for the sake of success, but for the sake of my soul, Rachel Joy Scott. Rachel had no idea when she wrote the things she wrote in her diaries that they were going to be printed in book form, and read by thousands and thousands of young people around the world. She had no idea that the cover of this diary would be seen on Dateline and Good Morning America, that the President of the United States would hold this diary in his hand with tears running down his face, or that people like Elton John would be so touched by her funeral that he would call and ask for me and my children and my wife to come and just meet with him and talk to him. And as I walked through Elton John's dressing room, something strange happened to me. I, first of all, I said, God, what am I doing at an Elton John concert? I'm as far removed from Elton John as you can get. None of my wigs look anything like his. And I, I, I'm not saying that to make fun of him. I'm just saying that we're his opposite. When you look in the dictionary under Elton John, it says the opposite of Daryl Scott. And when I walked in, something happened to me that night at that concert. Two things happened. One was I realized as I spoke some things that God laid on my heart to say to him, that I didn't know if he would receive or not. And I saw tears begin to run down that man's face. And I realized that God had people in his life that cared about him, that had a spiritual concern for his soul, and that had been praying for him. I realized that as I was talking to him, and that's been confirmed to me since that time. I've met two people who are close to him that are godly Christian people that have held him up in prayer continually. He has a tremendous influence on a whole generation of people. And the second thing that happened was that God began to convict me as I began to meet with people in this country with leaders, with politicians, with entertainers, with news people, that from a distance I had so lightly made fun of or disagreed with, some, sometimes joked about. And the Lord convicted me that if I would spend as much time praying for those that I so lightly talked about and joked about and judged, that I would see a lot more change take place in people's lives. And I want you to know that day I repented. I didn't repent of my convictions, and I didn't repent of the fact that I disagreed with a lot of things that goes on in this country. But I repented of an attitude that I had had 
that was contrary to the Word of God that says to pray for those that are in leadership and pray for those that have an influence on others and pray for those that are the rulers of our nation and others. And so I, I changed. And, and I want to just challenge you tonight to spend more time in prayer for those that you disagree with. And you'll be amazed at how God will put a love in your heart for people that you may have even despised at some point. And from that love, prayer can come forth that can bring a difference and bring a change in their lives. On the back of her diary, Rachel had written these words, I won't be labeled as average. And I believe she wrote not for her own sake as much as for her whole generation. She was expressing th something that I see in this generation of young people. And where she had written the words, I won't be labeled as average. There's a hole in her diary where a bullet had passed through her body and entered halfway through her diary as though it was an exclamation mark. I spoke before Congress, short, a House Judiciary Committee before Congress, shortly after Columbine, and the last words I said to our leaders was, my daughter's death will not be in vain. The young people of this nation will not allow that to happen. I want you to know, young people, that I believe in your generation. I believe that you have the power, more than legislation and more than politicians, to bring the needed changes that we so desperately need in this country to turn around and to make a difference. And I'm here tonight primarily because of you. But I'm also here tonight to honor my daughter, but most of all, simply to be obedient to what God has called us to do, to speak the truth about some things that happened. Before the tragedy took place at Columbine, there was spiritual preparation that actually took place in a number of families. And I don't know all the stories, and I don't share all the ones that I know because it would take too much time. But the Tomlin family are good friends of mine. In fact, all these families are. We meet together regularly, and there's a bond between us that I think will be there forever. But the Tomlin family lost their son, John, in the library. John actually threw his body across two of his friends and helped protect them as bullets, several bullets entered in his body and he was killed in the library where my son was at. John's last summer was spent in Mexico helping build homes for the homeless and witnessing to people in, in the country of Mexico. Uh, he was in his living room a few days before he was killed and his mother walked in, the whole family was there. His mother walked in the room and she said something to him that was absolutely startling. And it's something that if you parents think about, you, I doubt you've ever asked your child what Doreen Tomlin asked her son that day. She, she turned to John and she said, John, if anything ever happens to you, where would you want to be buried? And John looked up and she told me later, she said, Daryl, when I asked my son where he wanted to be buried, I had no idea I was going to do that. She said, I had goosebumps all over my body when I asked that question. John looked up from reading a book and said, Mom, I want to be buried in Wisconsin because that's where my best friend lives. And went back to reading his book. Because of that question and because of a number of other things that happened in the Tomlin family, there was a spiritual preparation that prepared them for the loss of John. The last thing John said to his girlfriend, Michelle, the night before he was killed, he stayed up till after midnight talking to her on the phone. And he said, Michelle, if anything ever happens to me, just remember you're in good hands with God. Last words he said to her before he said good night. Last words she heard him speak. About the same time that John's mom was asking him that question, Lauren Townsend, who was to be the valedictorian of our school of Columbine, uh, Lauren was the captain of the girls' volleyball team. Her mother's a coach there and a teacher there. She coaches the, the volleyball team. And Lauren drew a picture. Lauren's uh, mom and stepdad live a block away from my wife and I. And they came over one evening and they were sharing with us the story of Lauren's picture that she drew a few days before she died. She took it to the kitchen, gave it to her mom, and she said, I felt like the Lord wanted me to draw this picture as a gift to you, Mom. And so Don, Anna looked at the picture and she said, well, Lauren, what's it about? And Lauren said, it's what I believe it would be like if I were to die and go to heaven to be with Jesus. A few days later, that happened. The same day that Lauren was drawing that picture, I was having a two and a half hour talk with my daughter, Rachel. We sat at the dining table. We poured our hearts out to each other for two and a half hours. We wept together. We hugged each other. We talked about things. We, we covered all the bases. We just expressed how much we loved and appreciated one another. And in looking back on that, I realized that God was allowing us to have a goodbye talk. Now, it doesn't always happen that way for everyone. And I'm so thankful that I was able to have that kind of a talk with Rachel. But I want you to know that God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the day you were born, the day that you're going to die. How many of you believe that? I know two big words. Sovereignty is one of them. I use it as often as I can. I believe in the sovereignty of God. And I believe that God knew the day that Rachel was born and the day that we dedicated her to him and said she belongs to you and not to us. He knew that she was going to die at Columbine. If he knows the end from the beginning, if he's truly God, of course he knew. I had a cameraman from Dateline ask me after we had done a taping. He said, 
Mr. Scott, he said it in a, a very gentle way, but he said, let me just ask you a question. He said, where was God? He said, I've heard you express your faith, but where was God when your daughter was killed at Columbine? I said he was the same place he was at when his son was killed at Calvary 2,000 years ago. And he was the same place he was at when he miraculously spared my son in the library that day. He was with Rachel. He never left her. He never forsook her. I believe that he told the angels that had guarded her all of her life to step aside that today was his day. And I don't think they knew what was going to happen, but I believe that God did. Now, I know that sounds harsh, but I want to share with you some things that she left in our writings, in her writings, that brought closure to our family and that also shows some light on the fact that God's hand was at work in the Columbine tragedy or behind the scenes in the Columbine tragedy. Rachel had uh, written a number of things, and some of them are very po powerful, very positive. When she was about 13 years old, she and I had a Bible study, which I have had with each one of my five children when they got to a certain age, and it was a Bible study about witnessing to other people. And I've trained my children to not be religious in their approach because people aren't looking for religion. They're looking for true spiritual values, and they're looking for answers. And one of my favorite verses became Rachel's favorite verse. It was from Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. And so we did a little Bible study about this verse from the Bible, and it says this, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple, that I should know how to speak a word in season to those that are weary. Four things, that I should know how to speak what, who to speak it to, and when to speak it, in season to him that's weary. In Rachel's 13-year-old mind, she began to figure out who was weary at her school. And for the last two and a half years of her life, Rachel began to reach out to those that were weary at Columbine High School. And she targeted three areas of young people at her school, those that were brand new at school, first time, first, second day of school, those that were handicapped, and those that were picked on by others. And I have a, a stack of letters and emails from young people whose lives she touched and changed during that two years that she spent at Columbine. There's a young girl by the name of Amber, and I have an email from her. Amber lives in Georgia now. She started her first year of college. But she said, my mother had died, and I moved to Columbine. I moved to Littleton, Colorado. My dad moved us there to get away from the memories that he was haunted by my mother. And he said, we moved to Littleton for one month. She said, my first day at Columbine was the worst school day of my life. She said, I didn't know anybody. I walked into the cafeteria that day, went over and sat in a corner by myself. And she said, I was feeling sorry for myself. And she said, suddenly your daughter appeared with a big smile on her face, introduced herself, and she said, you look new at school. And Amber said, yeah, this is my first day. And she said, Rachel put her fingers in her mouth and whistled. My daughter could whistle real well. And four of her friends came over, and the five of them sat down and had lunch with Amber. Amber said later she realized that Rachel did this every day. She would walk into the cafeteria, look around. Anyone that looked new, she would go over, introduce herself to them, and begin to talk to them. And Amber had lunch with Rachel several times after that. Not every day, but several times. And about two weeks later, my daughter began to share her faith with Amber and led her to know the Lord for the first time in Amber's life. And she started a chain reaction in Amber's life. Amber said, I moved away from Littleton about a week before the tragedy. And on the day that it occurred, I was in my new high school in Georgia. And she said, I was watching as they brought televisions. They turned the TVs on and we began to see the unfolding tragedy. All I could do was think about the young girl who had been like an angel to me that had helped change my life. The week... About three weeks before Rachel died, there was a young man by the name of Austin Wiggins. Austin was a DJ, and he was 23 years old when he met my daughter one time. I met Austin at Rachel's grave, and he was watering her grave with 20 gallons of water. My daughter, oldest daughter, Bethany, told me, she said, Dad, there's a guy who shows up at Rachel's grave every day at around 5.30, and he waters her grave. So I was there at the grave one day when he showed up, and, and I asked him why he was doing what he was doing. And I was grateful that he was because there's no sprink there was no sprinkler system in that part of the cemetery at that time. And uh, <clears throat> he told me the story of how he had met Rachel. He said, I had a, one of those days where every... Have you ever had one of those days where Murphy's Law kicks into gear and everything goes wrong? And you don't want to see anybody happy. He told me that was the kind of day I had. He said, everything went wrong at work. He said, my boss was yelling at me. He said, I'm headed home and it begins to rain and I get a flat and it's turning dark. And I don't have an umbrella, I don't have a flashlight. He said, I just stood out there, and he said, your daughter pulled up behind my car, and he said, she bounced out of her red Acura, came up to me and said, hey, bud, looks like you're having problems. And he said, I just wanted to kick water on her. She looked too happy. And he said, within a few minutes, she had me laughing. Rachel had a very bubbly, outgoing personality, and she stood there and held an umbrella over him and a flashlight while he changed the flat. 
A few minutes later, she got in her car and drove off. And he said, I sat in my car, and I actually wondered if God hadn't sent an angel to help me change a flat. But three weeks later, he saw Rachel's picture on the front cover of the Denver Post, and he realized she was one of the victims of Columbine. He said, my heart nearly pounded out of my chest when I realized this was the young girl who stopped and helped me fix a flat. He came to Rachel's funeral. There were 3,000 people at her funeral, and there was standing room only. It wasn't a large building. It seated about 2,500, but there were 3,000 there. He stood in the back, and at the end of her funeral, he walked down to her casket and knelt before it, and for the first time in his life, he began to pray, and he opened his heart up to God. And my daughter started a chain reaction, and a young man's life that she didn't know before she died would make such a difference. There's 13 crosses that are at the, the head of Rachel's grave, Rachel's buried there. Next to her is another young man that was killed, Corey DeFooter, and Dave Sanders, the teacher, is also buried there. And at the head of their graves are 13 wooden crosses. Many of you saw those crosses on the news and, and different magazines and newspapers. And one of those crosses has my daughter's name on it. And written at the base of that cross on the wood, Austin Wiggins wrote, Rachel, through one act of kindness, you forever changed my life. Now I want to read to you something that we found under Rachel's bed. It's called My Ethics, My Codes of Life. It's a two-page piece that she did for a fifth-period class a month before she died. In March of 1999, she wrote these words. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read some segments. But she got a perfect score, and the teacher, her teacher wrote and said, You express yourself well. This article has touched my heart. I enjoyed reading it. And she says, Ethics vary with environment, circumstances, and culture. In my life, ethics play a major role, whether it was because of the way I was raised the experiences I've had, or just my outlook on the world and the way things should be. My biggest aspects of ethics include being honest and compassionate. Compassion is one of the greatest forms of love we have to offer. My definition of compassion is forgiving, helping, leading, showing mercy to others. I have this theory that if one person will go out of their way to show compassion, it will start a chain reaction. People will never know how far a little kindness can go. I dare to believe that I can start a chain reaction. She ended this essay by saying, My codes may seem like a fantasy that can never be reached, but test them for yourself and see the kind of effect they have in the lives of people around you. You just may start a chain reaction. And when Rachel wrote this, to her knowledge, the only person that was going to read this was her teacher. She didn't know if this was going to be selected to be read to the class or not, but she poured some of her thoughts into writing, and she intended for the reader to be challenged when she finished reading this. She had no idea that over a million people would hear her dad read parts of this essay and challenge them over the next year and a half after her death, or that it would be seen literally by millions of people. She had no idea that the state of Arkansas, which is talking to us right now about bringing this essay to every one of their schools, 758,000 young people in elementary, middle, and high schools, as a, a basis for their program on nonviolence. When she wrote these things and did these things, and young people, I just want to tell you something. God sometimes touches your heart to do things, and they may seem so insignificant and small. But just like the young boy who brought five loaves and fish to Jesus, and the adults were making fun, I'm sure, when they saw there were 5,000 people on a hillside listening to Jesus teach. And they were hungry, and the McDonald's was quite a ways away. They didn't have time to get there and eat. And Jesus had to feed this multitude, and there was nothing to feed them with. But a young boy walked up and handed him five loaves and a few fish, and Jesus began to break the bread, break the fish, and distribute it out through the apostles, the, the 12 that were there to help him, and as he did that, the fish and the bread began to be multiplied until all that crowd of 5,000 people had been fed and there were 12 baskets of food left over. Never underestimate what God can do with the little bit that you offer to him. Rachel did several simple things in the last two years of her life that God has taken and magnified over and over again. Cassie Bernal did a handful of things that if she had lived to be 80 years old, no one would have ever known. But because of her obedience... God has taken those things and multiplied them. John Tomlin just went and spent a few weeks in Mexico on a mission trip to help the homeless. He never dreamed that after his death there would be thousands of young people who would pick up his challenge and go to other countries in his name, just like many went to Africa in my daughter's name because she had wanted to go to Africa and help feed some of the starving children that were over there. And in the last year, we've seen so many young people that have picked up those torches and made a difference but more importantly than going to Africa or Mexico or somewhere else is to simply do the things that God puts before you every day. God gives you opportunity to bring change to those that are weary every single day. And Rachel didn't have a theory. She practiced what she preached when she said, I believe that I can start a chain reaction through acts of kindness. 
Five months after I read this, I listened to the young man who killed my daughter, Eric Harris, as he held the gun that killed Rachel. And he looked at a video camera in the basement of his home. And in, in the midst of a lot of profanity, he and Dylan made five hours of videotape that someday you will see as they're released to the public. But I listened to one hour of that five hours before they sealed it off because of lawsuits and a number of things that are going on in Littleton. And I'm so glad I listened to that one hour because as I listened to Eric Harris, I began to hear some things that I feel like the whole world needs to hear. I believe there are seeds of why they did what they did and what was behind it that we can learn from if we'll simply listen to what they were saying. But one of the things Eric said in the midst of a lot of profanity, he looked at the camera and he said, I dare to believe that I can start a chain reaction through violence. And when he said that, I had goosebumps because I remembered that my daughter had said the exact same words. I believe I can start a chain reaction. I've thought about that since many times. Here's two young people who were raised in the same city. They went to the same high school. They attended the same class. They had a video class together. Rachel actually witnessed to Eric and Dylan three weeks before she was killed. It was overheard by two of her classmates. They lived a few miles apart. They were born a few days apart, and they both died on the same day a few yards apart. And in March of 1999, both of them challenged your generation to start a chain reaction. Eric Harris started a chain reaction that caused a lot of hurt and a lot of pain and a lot of torment and a lot of anguish to a lot of people. But I want you to know his chain reaction hopefully has died out, but my daughter's is just beginning. And ultimately, good is always going to triumph over evil if we just give God a chance. So I want to share with you a number of things that Rachel wrote, but what I'm about to share is very uncharacteristic of her. I want to just kind of prepare the way before I read what I'm about to read, because when I read this, I literally wept and examined my own heart time and time again in the months that followed me first reading what I'm about to read to you. Rachel, from the time she was 12, wanted to be two things, and she never varied from her goals. She wanted to be an actress, and she wanted to be a missionary. Now, you go figure that one out, because I never could. And I told her one time, I said, Honey, I don't think you can be both an actress and a missionary. And she said, Watch me. Everything she did, she did with passion. Even when it was wrong, she did it 100%. And uh, Rachel, literally, and I, and I really wish I could have shown you pictures of her tonight. It was my mistake for putting the wrong video in. But Rachel, you could see in her eye, there was, she was a beautiful young girl. She starred in her high school play as a junior. It was the first time in Columbine's history that a junior took the starring role in year's high school play. She performed in every talent show and every play that took place during her time at Columbine. She loved acting. She had two colleges looking at her already offering scholarships for her acting ability. But more importantly than acting, she had a tender heart that reached out to other people. And she was one of those that would always stop and, and talk to a little baby on the sidewalk or pet a dog or reach out to the underdog. Always she did that. Sometimes it was almost irritating. You couldn't be in a hurry when Rachel was along because she'd pet every dog and talk to every baby along the, the way. But Rachel believed that she could make a difference. And during those two and a half years at Columbine, she got ridiculed by some of her friends because she was popular at school. She she had a lot of friends that were the top echelon of the school, and she refused to be a part of any one clique. And she had a reputation for that, that she would reach across all the boundaries. And some of her friends didn't like it that she reached out to those that other people didn't reach out to, that weren't as popular. And so I, there's so many things that, that I remember. I, I, I remember one day walking into her living, the living room, and Rachel was sitting on the floor, and she turned around and looked at me, and she said, Dad, someday you're going to see me on Oprah. And I smiled like any parent would, you know, and I said, okay, and uh, forgot all about that until about six months after her death, I was with a number of other parents to honor our children and the victims that were killed at Columbine and walked on the stage of the Oprah Winfrey Show, and there, under the letters of the Oprah Winfrey Show, un under those words was a picture of my daughter, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I remember the day that I walked in the living room and heard her say, someday, Dad, you're going to see me on Oprah. A number of things that she wrote were prophetic. There's no other way. You can call it anything you want. But there was a prophetic tone in some of the things she wrote, including what I'm about to read to you. What I'm about to read is not typical of Rachel. I never knew her to talk this way. It was a very morbid poem that she wrote. Later, the Lord helped me to understand that this was prophetic about the world that our generation has allowed to be created. I was in the country of Iran a few weeks ago. A friend of mine by the name of Bob Cranook is called the modern-day Indiana Jones by a lot of people. He's been on Dateline and Ripley's Believe It or Not in 2020. How many of you have ever seen a video on uh, the true Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia? Anybody here? Okay, a number of you have. 
And a number of you have seen stuff like uh, the, the search for Noah's Ark, I'm sure, different things like that. Bob is in all those videos. He's one of the top archaeological experts in the sense of the person who goes out there and puts his life on the line. And he's been in some very dangerous situations. He's been arrested six times in different countries. And uh, he just he's an ex-SWAT team captain. He worked with Jim Irwin for many years. Jim Irwin was a man who walked on the moon and drove a moon rover on the moon. He was one of the Apollo astronauts. And Jim Irwin and Bob climbed to Mount Ararat probably more than any person alive. And we were in the country of Iran, eight of us, doing some research on Noah's Ark because it's right near the Turkey border. And you can't go into Iran. I mean, go try to get into the country of Iran. You just can't get in there. There was no other Americans there. <clears throat> we went and slept on a mountainside, 12,000 feet. We were climbing up to 17,000. We were on the side of a mountain, and we slept with a, in a nomad village on the side of a mountain. These were Muslim nomads. And I talked to some of the teenagers in that village through our interpreter that we had along with us. He was a professor, professor from the Tehran University. And I asked the young people, the teenagers in that nomad village, expecting that they would know nothing about Columbine, I asked if they had heard about the shootings that had taken place in America. And when he asked them that question, they nodded their heads and a couple of them said, Columbine, Columbine. I was stunned. Here's a country halfway around the world. Two of those young men in that village had been in the city of Artibill and happened to watch portions of my daughter's funeral on CNN when it took place. A friend of mine, Josh McDowell, who <clears throat> travels around the world quite a bit, was in Russia recently. And Josh told me, he said, Daryl, when I got back from Russia, he said, he said, when I was there talking to these young people in this country where literally they're starving to death, he said, when I told them that one of my friends had lost a daughter at Columbine, he said, that's all they wanted to talk about was the tragedy at Columbine. There was something that happened at Columbine that captured not just the attention of this nation, but the whole world. Now, in light of the fact that Columbine literally was a wake-up call, I want to read what Rachel wrote. A few days before she died, she wrote these words. I'm dying. Quickly my soul leaves. Slowly my body withers. It isn't suicide. I consider it homicide. The world you have created has led to my death. And she wasn't talking to God. And I pondered those words and I, I took them to my own heart. And I, I really examined my own heart and life for a long time. And it caused me to repent. It caused me to repent of being lazy and not being aggressive enough to try to make a difference in the world that I live in and start my own chain reaction. Because my generation and the generation before me has allowed a handful of dissidents in this country to dictate to the majority of us what to do and even what to believe. We have robbed our young people of a spiritual heritage that our forefathers intended to be here forever as long as we were a nation. And in 1963, something drastic happened that affected this country from that day till this in a very negative way. And it wasn't the death of John F. Kennedy. It was something that took place shortly before he died. And that was that prayer for the first time in our country's history was removed from our schools. Shortly after that, the Bible, the Word of God, was removed from our schools. Now... I'm going to get on a soapbox for just a minute, and then I'm going to get back to Columbine because there's some amazing things I want to share before I stop tonight. But I want to get on a soapbox for just a minute, so bear with me. I want to tell you something. First of all, I'm going to ask you a question. I talked to a U.S. senator just the other day. If I named him, you would recognize his name. But I asked him a question, and I purposefully set him up because I, I wanted to hear what he was going to say about something. I'm going to ask you a question that I didn't ask him, and that is how many of you here can quote one sentence from the Bill of Rights. Anybody here? You're all Americans. I'm sure every one of you can quote all ten amendments in the Bill of Rights, but how many of you can just quote one sentence from the Bill of Rights? Okay. Why don't you stand up and quote, quote one sentence from the Bill of Rights? Okay. That's part of a sentence. That's pretty good. That's most than, more than most people can quote. That's, that's what one of the amendments is about. Somebody else? I, I saw a bunch of hands. Now that I'm asking you to quote, you're not quite as brave, are you? <laughs> Okay, back here. You're bouncing around there in the right direction. <laughs> okay, now you're going to take my thunder back there. We're going to have to get you a microphone in a minute. I just asked you to quote one, script, one, one, one sentence. That's good. I'll pick it up from there since I've got the microphone, but that's very good. Let's give him a hand. He's, he's hitting all around it there. 
The reason I ask that question is because I'm a history buff and I collect a lot of old history books and I have literally hundreds of old readers. A friend of mine, David Barton, kind of got me on this kick. And I do a lot of research in our early American history. And do you know that in the third to fourth grade in the 1850s, you couldn't progress any further in certain parts of this country if you couldn't quote all ten amendments in the Bill of Rights? I haven't met anybody in the last year and a half, and I've asked this question to probably 500,000 people, and only a handful of people are able to quote or semi-quote one sentence from any of our Bill of Rights. We don't know what the documents are that founded this country. We don't know very much about the forefathers of our country anymore because it's been removed from our history books. My stepson is a history teacher, and he said we've removed half of our country's history because we're afraid to put anything religious in our history books. But I'm going to give you a little conversation that I had with a U.S. Senator recently, and I'm going to put some bullets in your gun. I'm going to give you some ammunition to make a difference and maybe go out and have a little fun and start a little revolution on your own. But I said to him, <clears throat> why don't we have, when I was in school in Louisiana, I'm a redneck from Louisiana, just in case you didn't know. I grew up in Louisiana, and we, I use my belt buckle as a form of ID occasionally, <clears throat> and uh, mow my grass once a year and find my car. That's not true. My wife wouldn't like me saying that. But I live in Col lived in Colorado for quite a while, but I grew up in Louisiana, and we used to go squirrel hunting all the time. Do you guys squirrel hunt around here? They think that's cannibalism in Colorado. But uh, <clears throat> we went squirrel hunting, and we would take our guns to school in the 50s, early 60s, late 50s. We would take our guns to school and put them in our lockers, and if they weren't in our lockers, they were out in our trucks or cars, and we'd go squirrel hunting afterwards. Can you imagine what it would look like today in a high school if everybody brought their shotguns to school? You can't even take a rubber knife to school. They'll kick you out for a week. No tolerance rule. But in those days, we did. Now, I'm trying to make a point, and I spoke before our nation's leaders shortly after Columbine because we so easily want to find answers. So quickly, we want to find easy answers and solutions. And everybody began to jump on the bandwagon of gun control as though it were the cure-all for what happened at Columbine. And their weapons of choice were not guns. They were propane tanks. What Eric and Dylan wanted to do was blow up the cafeteria, and they took two propane tanks into the cafeteria, hid them, and set a timer. They said, if we don't kill at least 250, we will have failed. So their intent was to use propane tanks to do the killing. And I've asked some of our politicians, if they had been successful, would we be passing legislation against barbecue grills? Would we be examining propane tanks as though they were the culprit? I want you to know it's not the gun that's the issue. It's the finger that pulls the trigger. And it's the heart that caused the finger to pull the trigger. And it's the influences or the lack of influences on that heart that makes the difference. And when, when I read my daughter's poem, The World That You've Created Has Led to My Death, a month later I woke up one morning and I wrote a poem in response to that. And I don't normally wake up and eat breakfast and write poetry, but I did that one day of my life. And a poem just came off my pen and it said, Your laws ignore our deepest needs. Your words are empty air. You've stripped away our heritage. You've outlawed simple prayer. Now gunshots fill our classrooms and precious children die. You look for answers everywhere and ask the question why. You regulate restrictive laws through legislative creed. And yet you fail to understand that God is what we need. And when I finished writing that, I sat there and read it. Thank you. And when I finished reading that poem, I said, being highly intelligent like I am, I said, uh, that's a joke. I said, uh, hmm, this is for politicians and I don't know any. But you know what? God knows a couple of them. And four days later, I got a phone call from Washington, D.C. to come and speak before our nation's leaders. And when I did, I realized immediately why I had written that poem. I took a little speech and slapped around it, and I pleaded with them not to slap Band-Aids on deep, gaping wounds, that we needed to look deeper than surface issues. And so the other day, I'm going to tell you one little deadly lie that has caused our nation to suffer drastically. Do you know that in 1963, when prayer and Bibles were removed from schools, and if you don't believe in God, just believe in statistics. Look at what statistics show us. I have graphs that show what happened from 1963 until today. Before 1963... The violence, wave, the violence line had never gone above the population growth. For the first time in 1963, juvenile violence went above the population growth, and since then it's gone up almost 900%. Until 1963, SAT scores had never gone down more than two years in a row. But after prayer and Bibles were removed from schools, and I'm not, I'm not coming to any conclusions, I'm just giving you some statistics. For 18 years in a row, SAT scores went down, and they have never come back up to the level that they once were. In collecting old readers, I collect things like McGuffey's Readers, which were written in the 1800s. This is a, a copy of one. It's not an original. I have a lot of originals at home. But one of the things that I noticed in all the old readers was that they had chapters in them. Chapters like, for example, why it's important to be a moral person. 
Here's a chapter that says the righteous are never forsaken. Here's one that talks about the goodness of God and one called the hour of prayer. This one's called controlling your temper. This one's called sowing and reaping. This one is entitled religion, the only basis of society. Now, this was a McGuffey fifth reader used all across America. Another chapter in here says the character of a happy life. And it goes on and on. The Bible, the best of classics. And there was a lot of morality taught in our schools. But, you know, t today it's, it's politically incorrect to even talk about morality. Anything goes. It doesn't matter. We don't know what's right and wrong anymore because we're afraid to address it. I want you to know there's something wrong in this nation, deeply wrong. And Eric and, Harris, Eric and Dylan not only had negative influences in their life that I couldn't have. I couldn't go home after school in the 50s and 60s. And neither could a lot of you older guys out there with white hair or some other than no hair. We couldn't go home and put a video game in a machine and practice killing people for fun all evening long. We couldn't watch movies like Natural Born Killers over and over again. So I'm fixing to get off my bandwagon. Just hold on with me one more second. So I asked the senator this. I said, why don't we have the influences in our school that we had? And he said, shook his head and he said, because of separation of church and state. I'm sure every one of you have heard that statement dozens of times in your life. And so I just played a little game with him and I said, where do you get that from? Because I wanted to know if he knew the source of it. I, I do know the source of that statement. I wanted to see if he did. And you know what he said? He said, it's in the Bill of Rights. And I said, no, it isn't. And he said, yes, it is. He looked at me like, who are you? you I'm, I'm a senator. I've been to law school. He didn't say that, but that came across. And I said, he said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. And I happened to carry with me a copy of the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and I pulled it out and I handed it to him. And I said, Senator, if you can show me anywhere in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, or any historical U.S. document, those words, separation of church and state, I promise you I will give you $1,000 cash before the sun sets. I'll borrow it or get it from somewhere. He looked at me funny, he took it, he opened it up to the First Amendment. And when he read it, his face turned a little bit red, his jaw kind of dropped. And I said, what does it say? And he read, Congress will make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And I said, it sounds to me like we're violating the Bill of Rights when we prohibit the free exercise of religion. And then I asked him another question that I'm about to ask you, and I'm going to expose why we've allowed a handful of people who don't know what they're talking about and who totally have perverted this nation with the statement, separation of church and state. I asked him the question, who wrote that First Amendment? I'm going to ask you the same question. Now, he gave me an answer, and I'll tell you whether it was right or not in a minute, but let's have fun with this for a second. Even if you don't know for sure, who do you think wrote the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights? see some hands. Okay? James Madison. James Madison was one of our presidents, and James Madison talked in his inaugurational speech about God and, and how we were so blessed in this country. And James Madison was one of the ones who helped form the Constitution. He was there that day when the Bill of Rights was ratified, but he wasn't the one who wrote the First Amendment. It's a good answer. Somebody else, back here in the white shirt. Thomas Jefferson. Now, that's what the senator said. And that's a good answer, too. Thomas Jefferson was our third president. And guess what Thomas Jefferson did? Thomas Jefferson was not only the president of the United States, but he was the head of the, he was the superintendent of schools in Washington, D.C. area at the same time. And he's the one who instituted the Bible as the primary textbook in the Washington, D.C. school area. And he actually had Congress to publish the Bible for educational system and for the school system. And a friend of mine, David Barton, has one of those Bibles on the inside cover. It says, published by Congress for American schools. But he's not the one who wrote the First Amendment. He was in Paris when it was written. He was an ambassador to France at the time. Somebody else over here. Benjamin Franklin. That's a good answer. But <laughs> Benjamin Franklin was an 81-year-old. He was an old guy. He stood up on a cane and in a trembling voice in one of the congressional meetings. They came together, and these guys fought for three days over local issues, and the New York delegation had gone home. And Benjamin Franklin was the one who stood up after three days, and he said, Sirs, we have forgotten something. He said, we have forgotten that we founded this nation on our knees beseeching the help of the Almighty. And he said, we've gone three days talking about our local interests, and we've not spent any time in prayer. And Benjamin Franklin said, the sacred scriptures teach that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. He said, I propose that we do not start any more sessions here in Congress until we spend some time before God. That speech is found on the Internet. It's found on a lot of... You can easily find that speech of Benjamin Franklin... John Adams wrote back to his wife, Abigail, and gave the detail on what Benjamin Franklin said that day. And when he finished, they decided a few days later that from then on, they were going to have prayer before any session of Congress took place. You know that from that day until this, Congress never starts without prayer. When I was there that day speaking 
to the leaders of the country. They started in prayer. And one of the congressmen stood up when I finished, and he said, Mr. Scott, we are hypocrites in this country because we, every single day in this room, start with prayer, but we will not allow the same thing to happen with our kids in their classrooms. And I agree with him. We're hypocrites for allowing that to happen. But Benjamin Franklin's a good answer, but it's the wrong one. Let's go one or two more. Not Elvis. Not Al Gore. <laughs> He's the one who invented the Internet. Okay, back here. Someone actually said that the other day. John Adams. That's a good answer, too. John Adams was the second president of the United States. And John Adams, let me tell you a story about John Adams. He was in one of the congressional... In fact, he was at the first congressional Congress, the first meeting of Congress ever in this country. You know what the first thing Congress did? Ever. They had a prayer meeting. Guess how long it was? It wasn't five minutes long or 30 minutes long or one hour long. It was three hours long. Congress prayed for three hours. There had just been a massacre in Boston, and they were praying because they knew they needed the help of God in this country for the oppression they were receiving. And so they spent their time, and, and John Adams wrote to his wife, Abigail, and he said, you should have been at this prayer meeting. He said, the Reverend Duche stood up there, and he preached from Psalm 35, and we began to weep, and we began to pray. And he said, I could see George Washington over in the corner on his knees for three solid hours. He never got up. Patrick Henry was over in another corner praying. John Adams was a godly man, and he said many things about his belief in Jesus and God and the fact that the Bible was important to our young people, but he wasn't the guy who wrote the First Amendment. One or two more. John Hancock had beautiful writing, didn't he? First signer of the Declaration of Independence, the governor of Massachusetts, a great man of God, but he wasn't the one who wrote the First Amendment. Okay, we're going to stop with one or two more here. Back over here. Who? Jackson? No, it wasn't Jackson. He came a little bit later. Well, one more. George Washington. That's a good answer. George Washington is the one who signed all of this into law. And at the same time that he signed the First Amendment into law, he signed another document called the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance is one of the four most historical documents in our nation. And that ordinance was what the states had to agree to before they became a state. And that ordinance said under education, the first word under education said religion, morality, and education shall forever be taught in our schools. It is the moral for government and education. But George Washington wasn't the right one. Let me give you the right answer. I want you to remember this name because this is what I told the senator that day, and I'm sure he looked it up. He probably didn't believe me. But the guy's name was Fisher Ames. Just think of fishing and honey. Fisher Ames. Fisher Ames was one of the founding fathers of America. At 12 years old, he qualified to enter Harvard University, and he did. Later in life, he was asked to be the president of Harvard. He turned it down. He was the closest friend of George Washington. He was the one that the leaders of our nation asked to do a eulogy at George Washington's funeral. Fisher Ames wrote the First Amendment, and you can find this out with some research on your own. What I'm telling you is well documented. Fisher Ames was a man who never would have intended for his words to be twisted and perverted and to where today we hear separation of church and state instead of what he wrote. That Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And I told that to the senator. I said his intent was never to remove the Bible or prayer from schools. He said, how do you know that? I set him up because I knew he was going to ask that. And, I, and what I told him, I want you to, to know to start your own little revolution. This is fun to talk to people about. And it's this. Fisher Ames wrote an article, and it was published one month after he wrote the First Amendment, in the Palladium, which was a magazine like Newsweek or Time is today. And in that article, he wrote and he said, I have a fear that we have so many new textbooks coming into our school system that if we're not careful, we're going to remove the Bible as the primary textbook to our kids. And if that ever happens, we're going to have a moral problem in our schools because the Bible is the standard for character building and morality. He prophesied what would happen if we ever remove the Bible from our schools. These are the things that began to boil over in my heart as I read what my daughter wrote when she said, the world that you've created has led to my death. I want you to know that we need to, to not be destroyed by a lack of knowledge. We need to know the truth that sets us free. And young people, when you go back to your schools, have a little fun with your teacher. <clears throat> Rachel wrote something on March the 1st, 1998, and I'm going I'm to hurry through here tonight, but March the 1st, 1998, she wrote, and in some of the pages in her diary, she wrote to God. She says in this page, Dear God, I want to feel you in my heart, mind, soul, and life. I want heads to turn in the halls when I walk by. I want them to stare at me, watching and wanting the life that you put in me. I want you to overflow my cup with your spirit. I want so much from you. I want you to use me to reach the unreached. 
Rachel prayed a prayer. God, I want you to use me to reach the unreached. How many of you have ever prayed prayers and God answered them, but the answer didn't look like what you prayed for? Let me put it another way. Have you ever asked God for patience? Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> you know what you're going to get when you ask for patience. Don't do that on the golf course. I've tried it. It doesn't work. When you ask for patience, you're going to get trouble because trouble or tribulation is what works patience. Jesus said something very strange one time. He said, if we ask the Father for bread, he won't give us a stone. If we ask him for fish, he won't give us a snake or a serpent. Why did Jesus say those things? Because sometimes when we ask the Father for bread, he gives us what looks like a stone. And if we're not willing to receive the answer to our prayers and bite into that thing that looks like a stone, we will never taste the bread that it really is. Because we live in a world of illusions and it requires a single eye of faith to be a see-through or a not a look at her. Too many times we look at things instead of seeing through them. And when you look at things, you're looking at illusions. We all know that the sun never rises and never sets, but we still use that terminology. You don't hear weathermen tell the truth. They won't say, at 5.29 a.m. we're going to have an earth turn revealing the sun. And at 7.49 p.m. the earth's going to continue to turn, causing the sun to disappear. No, they lie to you. They say it's going to be a sunrise and a sunset, and the sun never has risen and it never has set. It's an illusion. But we buy into the illusions because it looks that way, it feels that way, it sounds that way. All our senses tell us that it's true when it's not. If I held a brick in my hand and told you this is not solid matter, it's energy, all of you would agree because of science. If I told you that this brick is not still, this wood that I'm looking at is not still, it's moving all the time. There's constant movement. All of you agree because you've learned that in science. But the Bible said that 2,000 years ago, that things are not made of things which do appear. And if I had told your great-grandfather that, they'd say I was nuts because they didn't have a microscope to prove those things. We live in a world of illusions. And if I only looked at Columbine, all I would ever see is a tragedy. I begin to pray on that day, God, help me to see through this to your hand. Rachel said, God, I want you to use me to reach the unreached. She said, I have such a desire and passion to serve, but I want to do that now. I want to know and serve you now. I want heads to turn now. I want faith like a child now. I want to feel you in my heart, mind, and soul now. I want you in my life now. I'm crying out to you, Father, asking for your spirit now. Seven times she used the word now. Looking back on this, we realize, our family realizes that Rachel had a sense of urgency in her life for the last two years of her life because she had shared with five of her close friends separately and also with her sister Dana that she believed God was going to use her to reach a lot of young people. She didn't know how it was going to happen, but she said to five of her friends separately that it was going to have to happen quickly because she didn't believe she was going to live to be old enough to get married. We found a letter on her desk at home, on her dresser at home, that she had written to a friend named Brittany. In that letter, she said, Brittany, keep your eyes peeled because God's going to use me somehow to reach a lot of young people. And she said, I don't understand how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen quickly. On, Mar on April the 20th, 1998, one year to the day before Rachel died, this is one year exactly to the day, she said, it's like I have a heavy heart and a burden on my back, and I don't know what it is. There's something in me that makes me want to cry, and I don't even know what it is. Things have changed. Last week was hard. I lost friends at school. Now that I've begun to walk my talk, they make fun of me. I don't even know what I've done. I don't have to say anything, and they turn me away. But you know what? It's all worth it to me. I am not going to apologize for speaking the name of Jesus. I'm not going to justify my faith, and I'm not going to hide the light that God has put in me. If I have to sacrifice everything, I will. I will take it. If my friends have to become my enemies for me to be with my best friend Jesus, that's fine with me. I don't think Rachel fully understood what she was writing, but she said, God, I want you to use me to reach the unreached, but she went a step further and qualified it by saying, I'm willing to sacrifice everything to see that happen. I remember the day that she walked in the living room and said, Dad, I want you to pray for me because I'm going to do a mime at school in the talent show. And she said, I'm afraid they're going to make fun of me when I... And she performed this mime in a talent show where nothing else Christian was going on. I sat five rows back in that auditorium that was packed that night with fellow students. And I, and I literally felt the anointing of God come down in that high school auditorium. And when Rachel finished the mime, we have it on videotape, when she finished the mime, those kids stood and gave her a four and a half, five minute standing ovation and tears were running down some of their cheeks. The lights were off and the spotlight was on the stage. None of us understood the anointing that we felt that night. But one year later, that same mime was going to be performed behind my daughter's casket and seen by the whole world on CNN. The largest viewing audience in CNN history was Rachel's funeral. And the whole world tuned in and watched a mime performed by a young girl who had taught it to my daughter. 
one week before Rachel died, she turned to her sister Dana and she said, Dana, I, I feel an urgency to teach you this mime, Watch the Lamb. And she taught it to my daughter Dana, who now performs it at universities, colleges, and high schools all across America. We found out after Rachel's death that her name means little female lamb. Rachel wrote on May the 2nd, 1998, these words. I wish you could see them on the screen, but unfortunately I didn't bring that tonight, so you can't. But this was the only words in her diary that night, that day. And she said, this will be my last year, Lord. I have gotten what I can. Thank you. A few days later, she wrote, just passing by, just coming through, not staying long. I always knew this home I have will never last. And then on an upbeat, she said, dear Heavenly Father, you are too good, God. Thank you for the people in my life. Please keep watch over them. I am so happy now that I've begun to walk my talk. Remember when I asked heads to turn the halls when I passed by? She asked God as though he may have forgotten. And uh, she said, I think a few people take a second look. Thank you for the light that you put in me. That light has had conviction on my friends. I don't have to say anything. They just see you in me. You didn't see on television, but following that tragedy, I spent a lot of time by my daughter's car. It became one of the shrines of the Columbine tragedy, along with John Tomlin's truck parked beside it. And for weeks, those two vehicles were covered with flowers and teddy bears and cards from around the world. But you could go out to that park, and I did many times at 3 o'clock in the morning, at midnight, and you would see young people by the thousands in Columbine Park, in, in Clement Park next to the school. And what the media didn't always show you was that there were prayer meetings going on, that there was singing going on. There was an incredible revival that began to take place in the wake of Columbine's tragedy that has since spread across this nation and around the world. The last poem that Rachel wrote before she died was a poem to God, and it was about her relationship with him and about her school. And she said, Am I the only one who sees? Am I the only one who craves your glory? Am I the only one who longs to be forever in your loving arms? All I want is for someone to walk with me through these halls of a tragedy. Please give me a loving friend who will carry your name until the end, someone who longs to be with you, someone who will stay forever true. There were 12 people who walked with Rachel through the halls of a tragedy that day. They were Dave Sanders, Stephen Kernow, Kelly Fleming, Daniel Mauser, Corey DeFooter, Kyle Velezquez, Daniel Warbaugh, Isaiah Scholes, Cassie Bernal, Matthew Kector, Lauren Townsend, and John Tomlin. I always take a moment to honor those people who were killed, along with my daughter. Eric and Dylan pulled up behind the school that morning. They took two propane tanks hidden in backpacks into the school cafeteria. They placed a timer. They already had it in place. They set it for 11.15. They had planted two bombs similar to that one in fields away from the school that both went off. There was huge explosions. People forgot about that quickly. It was just a bleep in the news. But the SWAT teams and the police had rushed over to two open fields where those bombs had gone off. But the one in the cafeteria didn't. And about 11.20, they realized that they weren't going to reach their goal of killing over 250 people. They said on videotape several times, if we don't kill at least 250, we will have failed. If those bombs had gone off, they would have killed approximately 450 people, according to the experts, because the whole cafeteria would have gone up in a ball of fire. When they didn't go off, they grabbed their guns, put them under trench coats, and began to run toward the school. A teacher standing outside the cafeteria saw them as they rushed up some outdoor stairs, and he saw them pull guns out from under their coats and began to shoot. That teacher was named Dave Sanders. He was the one that was killed at Columbine. He ran into the cafeteria, and he jumped on a table, and he began to scream at the top of his voice to clear out that there were kids shooting other kids. And the first person they shot was a young man by the name of Mark Taylor. Mark was hit eight times. He spun around. Nothing vital was hit, and he's still alive. But he turned around as he fell, and he saw them turn the guns back toward a corner of the school where two students were sitting on the grass. One of them was Richard Castaldo. Richard was hit eight times, and he's paralyzed from the waist down. He's a fine young man. He's still at Columbine this year. He's graduating. And beside him was my daughter, Rachel. Rachel was hit three times, and she was very grievously wounded and they rushed over to that corner where Richard pretended to be dead and Rachel was trying to crawl away she'd been shot in the leg and, and in the chest and the arm and they began to taunt her for her faith and we know this from the two people who heard the conversation take place they began to taunt her for what she believed in meanwhile Dylan went down the stairs back to the cafeteria by the time he got there there was no one left to shoot except a couple of young men running from the school one of them was Danny Rohrbach Danny was shot and killed on the sidewalk behind the school. And then 
he went back up and joined Eric Harris. And the last thing my daughter remembers is seeing the mountains in the distance. She was facing the mountains. I've, I've been in the very spot many times where she was killed. And she was looking at the mountains, and above her, standing above her, were two of her classmates taunting her for her faith in God. The last question that she was asked was these words. Eric Harris lifted her head up by her hair, and in a very sneering way, he said, Do you still believe in God? That was his exact question. And she said, You know I do. He said, then go be with him. And he shot my daughter through the temple execution style. But I want you to know, the next words that Rachel heard were God himself saying, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter to the joys of the Lord. And then those... <laughs> Eric and Harris then went into the school, took a right turn, and went down to the, to the library where my son was at, where 10 students were killed. My son heard Cassie Bernal 10 feet behind him. He saw everything that went on in the cafeteria that day, and he thought he was going to die. He was a hero that day. After the shooting, he helped pick up some of the students who carry them out that had been wounded. About a month after the funeral, I was in a daze for about a month, and about a month after the funeral, something remarkable happened that totally changed my life forever, and it's the reason that I'm here tonight. Rachel had left a lot of writings that I don't even have time to even get close to reading, but... Amidst a lot of her writing, she had drawn some pictures, and there were two pictures that she drew. I'm going to have to describe them to you. The one she drew a few months before she died was a picture of a cross and the words, Jesus Christ. And she chose a verse from the Bible that says, Greater love has no one than this that a person would lay down their life for their friends. That was the verse that she chose to use in this picture. And over on the right-hand side of the picture was a rose that was growing up out of another flower. And the flower that it was growing up out of was a columbine plant. Columbine is the Colorado State flower. And I didn't pay a lot of attention to that rose till later. Later it was to bring a lot of closure to my own heart. But the rose was dripping with dark drops of liquid that looked like blood drops. <clears throat> and again, I didn't pay a lot of attention to that until later. But I sat on the edge of my bed one morning, and suddenly my life had been totally turned upside down. If you've ever, anyone who's lost a child will tell you that all your priorities change immediately. My job that I'd worked for years on, had just been promoted to vice president of a good-sized company, had been sales manager there for years, and suddenly that meant nothing. I'd been an avid Broncos fan. Suddenly, that was about 384th on my list of priorities. Everything changed in my life. And God began to deal with my heart about what Rachel had left behind. And I began to realize that something needed to be said, something needed to be told, something needed to be done. But I didn't know how and I didn't know what. And I sat on the edge of my bed one morning after struggling for about a week, and I just said to God out loud, I just prayed, and I said, God, I just want to give everything to you. I just want to release my job, my future, everything, and I just want to do what you want me to do, but if you're wanting me to do something, you're going to have to open the doors, and I want to wear blue jeans. And <clears throat> that was my honest, honest prayer. And uh, God's been faithful to open doors, and I've been faithful to wear blue jeans. We have this agreement. I didn't want to be a preacher or a politician, and God knows we need a whole lot more good ones. But uh, I just wanted to be Rachel's dad, and I wanted to be who I was. And as I prayed that prayer, the reason I'm telling you this is because something happened that morning. My phone rang. It was a gentleman from Ohio by the name of Frank Amedia, who now lives in Florida. Frank is very well off. He owns businesses across the nation. And Frank called, and he said, Mr. Scott, you don't know who I am, but he said, I saw your daughter's funeral a month ago on CNN. He said, I've had a burden for you ever since then. And he said, I've prayed for you faithfully every day. But he said, the reason I'm really calling is not about you. It's about something that the Lord has, had, has done in my life. He said, I've had a dream night after night after night. I, I have it every night. And he said, I can't get away from it. He said, I'm writing a song about it called Rachel's Tears. He said, I've dreamed about your daughter's eyes. And there's a stream of tears flowing from her eyes. He said, please don't think I'm a nut. He said, I don't believe, I don't put a lot of stock in other people's dreams or visions. But he said, I know this is from God. He said, I've seen her eyes and a stream of tears, and those tears are watering something, but I can't see what they're watering. He said, does that mean anything to you? And I said, no, Frank, it doesn't. He was rather stunned that it didn't. He said, would you please write my name and phone number down? If it ever does, please call me, because he said, I can't get away from the fact that I believe this dream has some meaning. And so I wrote his name and phone number down, forgot about it after a few days, but seven days later, after he called, I got a phone call from the sheriff's department, and in closing, I want to leave this story with you. And they said, Mr. Scott, we have your daughter's backpack. And uh, we knew there was a bullet hole through her backpack. We suspected there was at least one diary. We found out there were two diaries in the backpack. I rushed over, 
and gathered her textbooks and her diaries and took them out to my truck and I opened up the last page of her diary like any parent would want to know what was the last thing that Rachel did. And what I saw absolutely stunned me because looking up at the page, the last page of her diary was a picture she had drawn. It's a picture of her eyes and there's a stream of tears flowing from her eyes. In fact, there's 13 tears that are clear. Within two hours of her drawing this picture, 13 people had been killed by the guns of Eric and Dylan. And those tears were watering a rose. And the rose, when the tears touched the rose, they turned to blood drops. And it was the same rose that she had drawn a few months earlier that was growing out of a columbine plant and was connected to a verse from the Bible that says, Greater love hath no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. I was absolutely stunned. I sat there for 45 minutes. I wept. I said, God, help me to understand what I'm looking at. Because this is far beyond coincidence that someone would call and so strongly announce that he had had a dream who could not possibly have seen what Rachel drew. We found out eight weeks ago that, that Rachel took this picture to one of her teachers. We didn't know this until eight weeks ago. Two months ago, my son called from school and he said, Dad, you have to hear what Miss Carruthers has to say about Rachel's drawing. I talked to her and I'm going to get this on video actually going to the school when I get back to, to the Littleton area. She said 30 minutes before Rachel was killed, she brought this picture to her right after she had drawn it. And she showed it to her and said, Miss Carruthers, someday the world is going to know what this picture is all about. And she said it was the strangest thing I've ever had a student tell me, especially in the light of the fact that Rachel was killed just a few minutes later. But as I sat there and looked at this picture, I believe with all my heart that God gave some comfort to me and spoke to my heart. And he said, this rose represents the youth of this generation. And out of this tragedy, I'm raising a, a whole bunch of them up and watering them and anointing them with my tears for a work that I've called them to do. Now, this happened before I had seen one single person come to know the Lord in salvation. This happened before I ever saw the revival take place at Columbine. And I shared this story a month after I saw this picture in Jackson, Tennessee, to a group of about 5,000 people in an open field. And a young girl brought her Bible up after I finished speaking, she said, Mr. Scott, three nights ago, God laid these verses on my heart that I was to show you, and I didn't know why. And now I do. And I read from Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17, these words. A loud voice was heard, Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, dry your tears and cease your weeping, for your work will be rewarded, says the Lord. And the children will return from the land of captivity, and I will bring them back to their own inheritance, saith the Lord. Those are from your Bible, Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17. And as I read those words, once again, I began to weep. And I said, thank you, God, for confirmation. From that moment until this, I've never doubted that Rachel's life and death were not in vain. I wouldn't bring her back tonight because she would not want to undo what we have seen happen over the last year and a half. We have seen young people who come from horrible situations. Two young men in the last year have come to meetings just like this one that had intentions to blow up their schools. One of them, his mother, was struggling for two weeks whether to turn him over to the police because he said, I am going to outdo Eric and Dylan. She practically drug him to a meeting like this, and God touched his heart that night and changed it. And that young man is now witnessing to his friends at school. Another one emailed me three months after a meeting like this in another state. He said, Mr. Scott, I planned to outdo Eric and Dylan. He said, I was angry at everyone. And he said, I didn't expect to have happen what happened. I came to make fun of what you were going to say, but I didn't expect God to touch my heart. Rachel wanted to start a chain reaction. I think she never dreamed that her life would have such an impact. When we were doing interviews for a television program, the, the host of that show said, if your daughter had only been able to live, look at what she could have accomplished. And I just shook my head and I said, you know, I wish my daughter had lived to be 80, 90, 100 years old, but how can you say that? She lived 17 years, she died. And through her life and through her death, she probably has accomplished more than she would have ever accomplished in five lifetimes if she had lived to be 100 years old. God has used the tragedy to touch the hearts of people. It was not only a wake-up call to this nation, but it was a call for us to examine the things that we've allowed to happen in this nation and to bring a change. Young people, you hold the key. You have the ability to bring tremendous change in the lives of people around you. In closing tonight... I just want to close with a simple challenge that I give everywhere I go. There's a young man by the name of Adam who was born with two major handicaps. He was born with an inability to pronounce words very well. He has a hard time talking. He was also born with a disease that caused him to age beyond his years, and he looked very different and strange 
from other young people. He went to Columbine. His mother talked to me a month after Rachel's death, and she said, my son comes home sometimes, and he goes to his room and just cries because he said every day, she said every day, your daughter reached out to Adam. He didn't have a class with her, but every single day she would find Adam in the hallways, and I think Adam started positioning himself to where Rachel would find him in the hallways. And every day Rachel would say something kind to him, and she said that meant so much to Adam. About three or four weeks after she told me that, before the NFL season started that year, the Denver Broncos and the Rocky, the Colorado Rockies, the Avalanche and the Nuggets got together for a softball game at Coors Field. There were 23,000 people there. They asked my son to throw out the opening pitch, and so I'm on the field with Craig, videotaping him, warming up with Terrell Davis and Larry Walker and all these athletes, and I go and sit down in the stands, and I sit down behind Adam. I didn't know who it was. I just sat down behind a young man. When he turned around and began to talk to me, I knew immediately who he was. And he said, Mr. Scott, very slow way of talking. He said, Mr. Scott, about an hour and a half before Rachel was killed, she found me in the hall, and she told me that she was going to have lunch with me next week. He said, I've never had anybody ask me to have lunch with him. He said, she asked me to tell me, all, she said, I want to know all about your family, Adam. I just want to be your friend. And tears started rolling down his face. And he said, Mr. Scott, that's never going to happen. No one's ever going to treat me the way Rachel did. And something rose up in my heart. And I made a vow to that young man. And I asked permission from him and his family to share this story with you. And they've encouraged me to do that. I vowed before God and before Adam that I would go around the nation as I traveled and spoke to young people that I would not only challenge them, but I would challenge everybody within the sound of my voice to start a chain reaction, to simply reach out. God puts people in front of you every single day. Right in this room, there are people that are hurting. And all we need to do is simply be obedient to the little acts of kindness. And we can see our city changed, our state changed, our nation changed. Right now, there is a revolution taking place of extreme kindness around this nation by young people. We get thousands of reports every single week. In closing, I'm going to ask one thing of you. I'm going to ask you to do something. I don't mean it to be religious. I just simply don't want you to look at one another. Would you close your eyes and bow your head because I want to see your response. This is why I'm here tonight. If you're here tonight, maybe you don't even know if there's a God or not. You'll never know unless you give him a chance. But would you be honest with me and say, Mr. Scott, I've never had the kind of relationship that you're talking about. I've never known... God the way that Rachel did. I've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll be honest with you. I don't even know. Maybe you don't even know if that's real or not. But would you be honest with me and say, I've never had that kind of relationship if you're here in that category tonight. Just lift your hands because I want to see you. This is for adults as well as young people. I see a lot of hands. Okay, you can put them down. There's a lot of hands that were raised. I'm going to ask a second question. If you're here tonight and you've had a relationship with Jesus Christ that was real at one time in your life, but you've walked away from that, and you've not been in fellowship with him, and he's calling you back to himself tonight, would you be honest with me and raise your hand and say, Mr. Scott, I fit in that category tonight? I'm going to ask a third and final question. How many of you will make a pledge tonight that you'll leave this place and you will start a chain reaction in the lives of others? Would you just lift your hand? Okay, you can put them down. Now I want you to open your eyes and look at me. The first two questions that I asked, there was a large number of people that raised their hands, but I'm going to ask something that's going to cost you something. I'm going to ask you to be willing to stand to your feet and come down here and get as close to me as you can because I want to tell you something. You're the person I'm here for tonight. Would you just stand, all of you who raised your hand on the first two questions, just begin to come. You'll be in a lot of good company as you come forward tonight. everybody gets up here and then I want to talk to you. First of all, I want to thank you for your boldness because it's not always easy to take a stand and to make a difference, but you're the answer to my daughter's prayer. You're the ones that she prayed for. She said, God, I want you to use me to reach other people. And she's done that again tonight. And she'll do it again tomorrow night and the next night and the next night and the next night. Life is just a vapor. Whether you live to be 117 or 17, it goes too quick. Rachel only lived 17 years, but she said, God, I want to make a difference in the lives of other people. 
every single every single time that I do this I pray God allow my daughter to see what's happening right now in the hearts and lives of people that are taking a stand and making a choice I'm going to ask some people who know how to, to counsel know how to pray to come and just stand behind these people because I want to pray with you before we leave tonight and I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Some of you have never had a relationship with the Lord. And for, for, for you, I want to ask you just to do something with me. In fact, I'm going to ask this whole crowd to, to join us so that you don't feel alone. I want you to do what you're doing, not because I'm telling you to, but I want it to be between you and God. Would you do that? I want you to pray out loud, but I want you to follow my words, but let them be your words from your heart. Would you just close your eyes, bow your head, and I want everybody in here to just pray with me as I pray. Father, I open my heart to you. God, I want you to be real in my life. I want you to fill me with the same passion that Rachel Scott had. I give you my heart and my life tonight. And Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to make me clean and whole. And I give you my life completely. Lord, just fill my heart tonight. In Jesus' name. Father, I just pray for those who came up here to make a rededication to you. You chose 12 people who turned the world upside down. And there's more than 12 that have come up to rededicate their lives tonight. And I'm asking God for you to pour out a baptism of your spirit and of the passion and the zeal of the Lord on these people who've come to rededicate their lives to you. God, those that are sitting, many who raised their hands that didn't come up. I'm asking you to touch their hearts in the days to come that you would kindle a fire. Lord, that you would bring a difference in their lives and allow them to be an instrument in your hands to have an impact on the lives of others. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you, if you would, those of you who are up here, just to bow your head for a few minutes and begin to pray just from your heart in your own words. Begin to communicate with God. Say, God, just be honest with him. There are good people here who are qualified to help you. I want to do this. How many of you came up here and... You, you were in that first group that I asked. You've never, you, you don't know if you've ever been saved, if you've ever had a relationship with God. You just lift your hand high. There's something that, that I, I really encourage you to do. There's people here who can pray with you. I want you to get with somebody, that, or some, some of you get with those that raise their hand and pray with them. And uh, there's some things that you may need to open up and talk about or, or pray about. God wants to meet your every need here tonight. I'm going to turn this back over to your pastor. But I want to thank you for having me tonight. God bless every one of you. I want you to go out and start a chain reaction. You can make a difference in this world. God bless you.